That Triathlon Show 393. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Michele Zanini. Michele is a PhD candidate at the University of Loughborough who is studying the connection between running economy, durability and strength training and he's also a physiologist and strength and conditioning coach with the Italian Triathlon Federation. And uh, a third arrow in his quiver is uh, working alongside uh, the legendary running coach Renato Canova. We ended up talking for uh, two hours, so I decided to split this interview into two parts. So today is part one, and next week we'll hear part two. And uh, in part one here today, we'll hear about uh, Michele's work with the Italian Triathlon Federation. We will discuss the science of running economy and durability. And then next week, we discuss strength training for endurance performance and uh, Michele's work with uh, Renato Canova, as well as uh, Canova's training principles. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to our sponsors, Form. The Form smart swim goggles give you real-time feedback in your swim training right on the goggle lens, including splits, a pace, stroke rate, and heart rate. This means that you can execute your swim workouts uh, better whether it's pushing harder when you're starting to fall off the pace or holding back when you're accidentally going faster than you should it also means that if you're using a garmin watch in the pool you can finally get rid of that because the goggles will automatically start and stop each interval when you push off from the wall or reach the wall at the end and they will give you accurate splits uh, based on that Personally, I also think that it makes swimming more fun and uh, motivating when you have some uh, feedback within the intervals, not just between intervals. And it uh, does make me want to go to the pool more often as I have the uh, accountability of the goggles uh, throughout the entire workout. You can get 15% off the goggles with the code TTS15 on forumswim.com forward slash TTS. And thank you to Senate. The Senate Indoor Swim Trainer allows you to improve your technique, power, and swim training consistency, even if you're short on time. It is a great tool for busy athletes because you can do a quality Senate workout in just 15 minutes at home, even on days when you don't have time to get to the pool. It is a perfect complement to pool and open water swimming as it allows you to focus specifically on key aspects of your swimming, like your catch and your power, and you can isolate them more easily than you can in the water. You can try to send it risk-free for up to 30 days, so if you don't love it, just send it back, and you can get 20% off your first order on senatesuntrain.com forward slash TTS. Now, without any further ado, here's part one of my interview with uh, Michele Sonini. Welcome to the Triathlon Show, Michele. How are you doing? Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And how are you, Michael? I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, so uh, tell us a bit more about yourself. Uh, who are you for the listeners that haven't heard about you before? Yeah, no, thanks for inviting me over, first of all. I've uh, been a, a hungry um, follower of your podcast in the past few years. So uh, really Glad to be invited and wanted to commend on uh, your efforts at uh, the, the effort you put over the last uh, few years on this. Uh, but yeah, I'm a, a physiologist and I'm finishing off a PhD in exercise physiology at Loughborough University. Alongside, I work with uh, professional athletes, uh, both in running and triathlon. And uh, I work primarily as SNC coach and physiologist for them together with my job with the Italian Triathlon Federation at the moment. So can you explain that uh, in a bit more detail? So you work with the Italian Triathlon Federation, uh, and that's with the triathletes, obviously, but when you mentioned working with runners, what is what is the, the setting of that work? Yeah, so I've been working with uh, runners from uh, probably seven, eight years now, and uh, I've had the chance to go to Kenya a couple of times with uh, two different coaches and then started developing uh, some connection with Renato Canova and I had the chance to be close to him for a few years now and uh, yeah been supporting part of the SNC for for his group uh, as well as just applying uh, the knowledge from Renato to uh, less uh, professional athletes or let's say uh, recreational runners or uh, non-professional runners really and then moved uh, to triathlon from there. Yeah, no, that's a really cool opportunity, and we'll discuss more about that in a little bit. Um, and but then one other follow up on your introduction is your PhD that you're finalizing. What is the topic of that PhD? Yeah, we're basically looking into the relationship between uh, running economy, uh, durability, or fatigue development, or fatigue resistance, 
think we still have to find the precise word to describe that, but basically how physiology changes as we fatigue and how that affects performance and uh, uh, linking up with uh, strength training and how that can be helpful to prevent fatigue development. And uh, I work with uh, Rich Blagrove, which has been probably among the most influential people in, in the area, as well as Jonathan Follan, which is very much into uh, neuromuscular performance and, uh, and uh, running economy itself. Yeah, and Rich Blagro has been a guest on the podcast before, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. What I want to uh, talk about first, I guess, is uh, just the role that, as you described, being a physiologist and strength and conditioning coach within a high-performance setting like the Italian Triathlon Federation. So uh, can you talk a bit in a bit more detail about what that role entails? Yeah, um, I think when we look into the uh, applied side of physiology for supporting athletes, uh, when, when we get uh, the scientific lens, uh, the research lens, we always think about lab testing and, uh, and how to optimize that. When you work with athletes, you have a very big part of it, which is uh, related to the race demands and the uh, training uh, um, measurements and, and feedback, basically. So I would say the three roles that uh, we try to achieve uh, or the three outcomes we, we try to support uh, with the federation at the moment is racing analysis and therefore trying to work out the demands uh, that uh, the specific race has and how the individuals we're working with, uh, they can uh, bridge the gap between their performance uh, or their physiology at the moment uh, to the race demands. Then supporting training prescription via physiological testing. Uh, so we may get uh, some threshold assessments and make sure that uh, they're training at the right intensity or if they need uh, extra work in an area, then we can try to give some, some support on that. And then uh, try to support uh, training methodology and uh, racing strategy via uh, evidence-based uh, uh, support, uh, which uh, can then... Uh, basically be implemented by the coach uh, based on uh, their individual uh, needs. So we can say, well, actually, you may want to add this type of workout uh, with uh, with this given athlete because uh, you, you're you missing an anaerobic capacity sort of uh, um, outcome, for example. Um, so f- to give an example, uh, just recently we've got a test from, from an athlete which is racing uh, in, uh, in World uh, Triathlon Series uh, and uh, he's been lacking a little bit uh, the specificity on the run. Uh, so he would get uh, a very good swim and very good uh, bike, uh, but then when he comes to the run, he still has to develop that uh, pace uh, that is required for the races. Uh, and uh, when you look back, at his uh, training logs, you could see there was a lack of that specific intensity. So running, uh, I think in World Triathlon Series at the moment, where if you want to be top 10, you're around, run, you have to run around three, uh, 255 to 302, 305, uh, probably t- three, three flat 302. Um, and yeah, if you're training uh, very far away from there, you won't be able to achieve that in a race mainly when, when you got a run off bike. So the target uh, to develop over the last few months has been, well, try to get some consistent uh, uh, exercise uh, in that area, basically around the second threshold or just above the second threshold, which wasn't uh, happening before. Mm. And uh, just out of curiosity, because uh, there could be one or two possibilities here uh, that I see. I mean, one of them is that, well, this athlete never trained, that, that he was always training quite a bit below that speed but then the other could be that i've also seen and heard about is that athletes go and do a bunch of really fast 400s on the track 240 pace 245 pace but then in the race they can only run at 310 315 pace so they are just training way above what they are actually capable of doing in in racing and somebody like joel filial has been um some very kind of i guess outspoken uh, almost about how you have to earn the right to uh, to train at certain paces, basically right. racing, r- training closer to your race pace, and and there's no need to go above that. But of course, there's there's a push and pull there, I, I guess. But but what was the example with this athlete? Was he always training, or was he never training fast enough, or was it that he was just training too far above that race pace and not reaching that specificity? Yeah, uh, as you said, uh, you probably need a little bit of. Uh 
speed support. So this particular athlete was doing it. If anything, when we tested him, his speed at VO2 max was pretty good. And the first threshold was also good. But the gap between VO2 max and the second threshold was a little bit uh, too much. Uh, and we look back at the training logs uh, and the type of workouts he's been doing recently. And uh, you could clearly see that uh, that target wasn't happening, that uh, intensity in training uh, wasn't wasn't happening and uh, i think that's bridging uh, two of the air well all the three areas i've mentioned actually so we've got a physiological test uh, for which we could uh, uh, have an idea about what uh, uh, the athlete is lacking we've got the race demands uh, so well we know that uh, to race at this level you need to run at this pace uh, and then we've got the training log analysis for which we've realized well you're actually not doing as much uh, specific work uh, in that realm as you need to. Um, and probably we got the chance to speak about it later, but I believe uh, you you have a funnel of intensities uh, that uh, you, you need to work towards. So you got like your specific uh, race demands and uh, but in running is very easy because you just have race pace in uh, other uh, sports is different in trials when you have the tactics, you have the ability to uh, run to stay on the bike and stay with, with the group uh, and uh, be able to produce maximal efforts continuously over the over the race uh, but to keep it simple for the run now uh, you have that specific speed that you want to target for the race uh, and you can support it from both the endurance and the uh, speed end and funnel through from uh, something which is maybe 10% or 15% faster and slower and then go towards the the target speed as the training progresses so this runner was do he was doing both of that on the sides but he he was uh, not really hitting those specific paces is, uh, when you looked at his training log yes exactly okay okay got it well, if, he, uh, uh, if he was hitting uh, you, you it would have been maybe just too little so maybe okay. you would get it uh, for uh, two three kilometers in a workout of 10 and that probably is not enough because if you have to run an olympic distance that's going to be 10 kilometers at that space at that pace so if you train just two or three uh, that may not be specific enough uh, in some part of the season yeah uh, when you mentioned analyzing race demands this is something that i think is really interesting in in short course uh triathlon because obviously we we know the as you say the the paces on the run that, that are required and and the speeds on the bike and i I guess most athletes you do use a bike computer and power meter, so the bike is a bit quite easy to analyze. Uh, on, the, on the swim side, we know again the splits, but but the one thing I guess with the swim and the run, most athletes uh, they or, well nobody uses a watch on the swim, and and only very few athletes does it on the on the run. So first of all, you have to I guess trust that the that the distance is measured accurately, and there is in world triathlon of course they are i think they have a 10 percent margin of error for the run so the run could be between 9.6 to 10.4 kilometers and that would be okay how how do you uh analyze the race demands or even how a race went from that perspective when compared to long course triathlon i think there is you have a lot less data to actually work with yeah, so um, first of all, I want to make clear that that's not only my work. It's a team of four of us, and uh, there's one person that just takes care of uh, the data analysis. Uh, so it's really a team effort uh, all the way through. We And I think that gives us a lot of value to each other and to the team and to the office because I've got my ideas and somebody else might have slightly different ideas. And when we get together, when we get them together, it, it just makes it better, to be honest. And yeah, I want to commend uh, his work uh, because he's been uh, super insightful in the last uh, year and a half with with the support of the team. Uh, but basically, from from the running perspective, we've got uh, uh, stride uh, foot pots at the moment. We just fit it to the athlete, uh, or we try to fit it to the athlete uh, when uh, when they're about to race, uh, and then we just uh, keep the record of that, and we got. Well, all the biomechanics data that uh, can be given from from the pod, and it's very accurate on the speed as well. 
So we tested it uh, uh, in the lab against uh, the uh, treadmill and uh, on the on the track as well. And uh, as soon as as long as you calibrate it uh, for the right uh, shoe, so it, it has some some errors based on the type of shoe you use. But as long as you calibrate it beforehand, uh, it is very accurate, and you can actually see the pacing of the athlete as well, because uh, you get splits uh, from the races, but. They vary. They may be eight splits. They may be four splits, uh, and uh, you don't really get to see the final uh, uh, kick or the initial burst after after the race. After sorry, after the bike. While well, with uh, with the home pod, the, with the foot pod, you can actually see the full profile of the athlete and see how the behavior changes during the race or due to some some events happening within uh, within the run. So we've been trying to push. Uh, uh, coaches to to implement that in training as well just to have a comparison between training and racing and and yeah that he's been quite helpful with with just pacing and and racing strategies for for the for the run part of the race that's yeah that's really cool um yeah really really nice way of of doing it because the stride can record in its internal memory i guess without without needing to have that watch to transmit to or or even a, a phone obviously <laughs> you don't want to run with a phone in a race like that so um yeah that's that's a smart smart way of doing it the and uh when you talk about the physiological testing and how that can inform training prescription uh are there any other other than the example you already mentioned are there any other examples that you could point to just to get a an a bit of a broader idea of how how this is used in a high performance setting the testing and how it then relates to the training prescription yeah so um when when we look into the testing for these type of athletes one thing that we want to consider is uh, the time that you have available so it it gets very hard uh, to get full protocols that may be optimal maybe very accurate but they were they may require two, three, or maybe half a day of testing sometimes. So you really don't have that time with with athletes and uh, mainly with triathletes that they train uh, anything between 25 and 35 hours per week. Uh, so you really need to get uh, the test done quickly and try to get as many data as possible. So you may have to compromise a bit uh, the quality uh, of the test uh, and uh, try to get the most important uh, outcomes. Uh, so sometimes we prioritize the bike, sometimes uh, we, we get bike and running. Uh, uh, it depends which part of the season we are in at the, uh, as well. So at the beginning of the season this year, for example, we just focused on the bike because uh, they needed uh, to build up a lot of uh, uh, kilometers on, on the bike and we wanted to make sure that they were riding at the right intensity. Whether after the winter period, uh, you want to have an idea of the baseline uh, uh, post-general preparation of ahead of the races. So you may want to test both. Uh, we've got some swimming testing as well, but of course that's a bit more complicated because you don't really have uh, the chance to measure as many uh, variables as you would get from running and, and cycling. Um, as for the testing itself, uh, we just try to run the test within uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and uh, the bike uh, is a ramp test, uh, whether with the run, we tend to use a step test uh, with uh, lactate uh, measurements because that is probably a bit more uh, reliable with running. Uh, a ramp test with running due to the ventilation, which is slightly different on running. Uh, it, yeah, I, I find it a bit more difficult to interpret. Uh, so you can get VT1 and VT2, but uh, uh, yeah, I've, I found a bit more difficult than uh, using lactate threshold one and two for training, uh, uh, not really training prescription, uh, just just uh, to get an idea about where the two thresholds stand and how far they are from VO2 max and uh, from uh, uh, from each other. And why do you prefer the ramp test on the bike compared to the to the step test? Do you prefer the ventilatory thresholds because it is you can get them more reliably on the bike compared to the lactate thresholds? Uh, that's it. Probably just because it's quicker. Uh, so there's another physiologist that uh, takes care mainly of, of the bike. So again, it's a teamwork. Uh, I take part of the strength and conditioning and uh, the running side, uh, and he takes care primarily of uh, the cycling side. Uh, but we walk together, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really a push and pull of compromises. Uh, um, but yeah, even re in research, I think 
um, the uh, ramp test uh, works quite well and is quite reliable. Whether with with running, you may get a bit more noise just to yeah, just due to the to the running, which is uh, by basically making bounce the wire as as you're going along. So you may get a bit more issues. And even just like ventilation wise, you have a bit more variability on the run than than on the bike. Mm. And uh, do you have any interest in the other physiological uh, parameters than the thresholds, whether they be ventilatory or lactate? Do you are, for example, on the bike? I mean, you measure VO2 max, I'm sure, but is that an interesting parameter that you actually, or actionable parameter, let's say, that you identify certain athletes might be lacking there or certain athletes are more than uh, well-equipped enough in terms of VO2 max? Uh, And are there other parameters uh, that that you're also looking at uh, in terms of the physiological markers? Yeah, I mean, probably the full profile of VO2 max thresholds and the uh, economy or uh, cycle, the cost of exercise either in running or cycling gives you the three determinants of performance from, from joiner model. And uh, you can have an idea based on the database we've got uh, on how the artists are sitting within uh, the ranges that we would expect. Uh, so powered VO2 max or, or, or speed of VO2 max, uh, we, we have uh, now a, uh, decent idea about where they should sit uh, for for this type of athletes and uh, maybe for junior athletes or under 23 athletes as well uh, so that gives you an idea about the development uh, of the athlete longitudinally as well and having the view to max uh, sort of as a ceiling uh, you can look into lt1 and lt2 or vt1 vt2 but basically the two thresholds uh, between uh, uh, moderate and heavy and heavy and severe domain uh, to uh, grasp an idea about how close they are to the ceiling. If you have an athlete which has got a LT1 of 95% uh, uh, view to max, you know that uh, that's going to be very hard to push up unless you raise the ceiling. So you you do maybe a little bit of work on uh, view to max speed to try to raise that. Uh, on the other hand, we also test uh, uh, fat max for cycling. Uh, we, well, we, we're looking into maybe considering doing it for running but uh, my belief is that the speed is going to be too low for for it to be trained uh, so um, we will looking into it but yeah at the moment we're not really estimating it and then we look into uh, some some maximal efforts uh, on the bike uh, for for power production and uh, uh, maximal power there uh, Finally, we've got some testing from a uh, strength perspective and, uh, and reactivity perspective. So uh, drop jumps and uh, isometric mid-type pool at the moment that we're trying to implement uh, uh, at training camps when uh, the athletes, they come all together and we, we can test them back to back one after the other. And uh, you've talked about how this is uh, a teamwork and a team effort. How does, how do you, as a physiologist and uh, the other physiologists uh, work with the coaches is there a lot of push and pull there between the coaches have their ideas and uh, and the physiologists have their ideas or or are you generally on the same page uh, how how does that work in general yeah uh well depend it, it really depends on the person so um one thing that uh, i personally try to focus initially is just to get to know the coach and uh, the athletes uh, and uh, try to understand uh, their, their way of walking and even just like their way of communi- communicating really because uh, uh, communication to me is key uh, and uh, you see day in, day out in any environment. Uh, you, can be, you can be very knowledgeable, but if you can't communicate uh, appropriately, uh, you really lack uh, opportunities. You really uh, struggle creating an impact. So first of all, you want to make sure that uh, your input can be taken uh, in in a positive way from the coach and then from there you can start uh, giving inputs uh, so it's it's initially just trying to create the trust between what you're doing uh, and uh, what you can provide uh, to the coach and then just try to suggest uh, implementation of of uh, optimization of training or racing uh, or Maybe just make a comment about, well, this race went this way, this may be the reason. Uh, initially, it is tough when you get into the new environment because, well, nobody really knows who you are and what you can give to them. So I think a lot of people try to just 
prove themselves as uh, they start off, whether, uh, uh, yeah, it's probably best to try to provide the value as you go along. So there's no need to step into the environment and say, oh, I, I can do this, 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 this. It's more like, well, let's see uh, what can I provide, uh, just looking at uh, your work and uh, and how you're doing things at the moment. Uh, and from there, I try to give some insights about it. Uh, so one example I can give about this is not related to physiology, it's related to strength training, uh, but uh, it, it is quite clear. So when I started supporting uh, some of the athletes uh, from a methodological strength and conditioning perspective, uh, I just stepped in the gym and uh, looked into the, the program of the athletes and, uh, and followed them uh, through, through the training, having conversations with the coaches uh, before and after training, and eventually coaches just started asking my opinion and uh, tried to implement some of the suggestions. And then from there, uh, we started working together. And now uh, I've, I've, and I'm ending up supporting more than half of the national team um, directly and then just overseeing the methodology of, uh, of other coaches as well. So, yeah, I think it would have been very different if I would have just stepped in and said, well, you're doing this, 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 uh, suboptimally, we can optimize it in uh, this, this, this way. It's really getting to know the environment you're in, first of all, and then uh, try to give insights about uh, uh, what can be changed or optimized. Yeah, that's a perfect example. Uh, thank you for that. Is there anything else that you want to mention or talk about uh, with in regard to working in a high performance setting as a physiologist and strength and conditioning co coach before we move on to the to the next topic or do you think we we covered most of it yeah and no, i think we we covered most of it again uh very important to to just have a efficient effective communication and uh, uh just having a teamwork so having a two-way uh, communication of course within the sports science team and then uh, between uh, the sports science team and the coaches. Uh, I think we, we don't get uh, as much pressure as the coaches get uh, because the results, uh, they, they are dependent on our work, but not as much as the coaches. So you want to be yeah, aware of that when uh, uh, you may yeah, want to try to implement something new and uh, the coach goes, well, uh, I don't know if I want to do it or they say, well, not now. So yeah, even just giving well-timed uh, suggestions, uh, it is probably important. Uh, and of course, coaches are more uh, interested in, in trying something new when they're far away from the main season or when some positive results are happening. So yeah, uh, that, that may be uh, something that, uh, yeah, you want to consider strategically when you can, you want to try to make an impact. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. Uh, so moving on a bit to the topics you mentioned that you're working on as part of your PhD. So um, a strength and conditioning, running economy and durability. We'll discuss all of these topics a bit and how they relate. So maybe we start with running economy. Uh, how, how important is that for running performance? And uh, and are there differences between different events if we compare, for example, the, the marathon with the uh, mid-distance events, for, for example? Yeah, of course. Uh, so running economy, as we mentioned before, it can be considered one of the three parameters uh, for uh, determining endurance performance or running performance. You get VO2 max, uh, you get thresholds uh, or fractional utilization of VO2 max uh, at uh, a specific pace, which can be the marathon or can be a 10K or whatever it is. And then uh, you've got uh, running economy. So that's basically the cost uh, of uh, the exercise you, you're performing. Uh, and well, you can use either energy cost or oxygen cost. Uh, there's a lot of debate at the moment uh, between the two and which one is better. Um, I think at the moment we can just both, yeah, we can just use both and, and uh, well, uh, emphasize either of them depending on the, the focus we have and what we want to inform. Um, as for uh, how does it change uh, as determinant of performance as the length of the of the run changes so the, the event moving from let's say 800 meters all the way to the marathon it gains uh, more uh, uh, influence uh, as the race lengthens because uh, basically you just uh, well uh, running economy being the cost of running uh, 
the more economical you are, uh, the more energy you're going to have towards uh, the end of long lasting races. Uh, so it not, it's not as important in 800, 1500 meters uh, where you got a lot of anaerobic contribution as well, where uh, the more you lengthen it, uh, the farther it goes from, uh, the, the farther the intensity goes from view to max uh, as well. So the view to max may get a little bit less important. And on the other hand, uh, running economy gets more important because it's basically giving you an idea about how much uh, your uh, glycogen is depleting, for example, how much your storages are depleting as you exercise. And uh, well, that capacity, it may eventually limit uh, your, uh, your outcome. Uh, so, um, one other important thing to to mention about that is that with high profile athletes uh, uh well, elite athletes uh, i think is a paper from the 1980s 1990 uh they pointed out uh, that uh, uh running economy it's more uh it can it can be more uh correlated to performance than view to max so basically when when you're an elite your view to max is going to be very similar across the board but uh, <clears throat> Running economy, it will vary, and the athlete that is more economical it may uh, be able to uh, perform better. Um, and of course, well, running economy influences both the speed of your max uh, and the sub maximal speeds. Because uh, if you've got uh, an athlete that has a, uh, let's say, I don't know, 70 millimoles, um, sorry, for milliliters per kilo uh, of your max, uh, um, but uh, you're using more oxygen. Uh, at the same speed, then you're not going to be uh, as quick at the speed of your two max, and likewise for some maximal speeds. Uh, it's more, it's much, it's much more easy to <laughs> describe via graphic, uh, but well, that's one of the limitations of uh, of podcasts, uh, and it, it is probably one of the capabilities that can be improved with training more than view to max. So. If you look at longitudinal data from uh, Polar Redcliffe, uh, from Andy Jones' paper in 2006, you can see that uh, from where she was, uh, I think, under 20, all the way when she set the world record in 2003, she kept her view to marks fairly stable, uh, but her uh, running economy got better and better and improved by roughly 15%. And of course, alongside, the performance went up and the speed of view to marks uh, got faster and faster as well. Yeah, that's a good summary. And one thing just to uh, to mention as well for the listeners, when, when you say that running economy is one of the determinants of endurance performance along with VO2 max and fractional utilization, then basically what that means is that, is that uh, you, can, you can essentially, if you know all of those three parameters, you can predict a performance, which was done, I think, with Paula Radcliffe as well. Andy Jones did that, maybe not in a paper, but at least I, I remember him saying that he, he did that uh, very closely in, for yeah. several of her yeah. marathons. So, so knowing her VO2 max and her running economy and her fractional utilization, he could say that you're going to run a 216.30 or whatever it was for, for any given marathon. And, and yeah, of course, it's not necessarily going to be 100% correct, but you're going to get pretty close if you know those, those three parameters. And that's why they are the, the determinants of, of performance. Um, so. So yeah, you have des uh, described how running economy is very important. It can be improved. It can be improved longitudinally, maybe more so than VO2 max. What are the factors then that that influence running economy? Yeah, um, you got a fair few, and I don't think we know all of them yet. Uh, so uh, we've got, of course, uh, uh, fiber type. So type uh, one fiber, they tend to be more economic and more efficient because they have a higher mitochondrial density and, and mitochondrial efficiency. So that's another parameter. You get the substrate availability and utilization. So uh, if uh, you're able to uh, use a higher percentage of carbohydrates of fat that may influence economy so uh, basically as the respiratory exchange ratio drops uh, and therefore the fat uh, utilization goes up uh, your uh, efficiency well not efficiency really uh, your economy gets worse because you're using about uh, 10 12 percent more oxygen to to use uh, fats than than carbohydrates so uh, that's one thing to to keep in mind when uh, when you're looking into maybe uh, analyzing some data from uh, from long-lasting efforts or long-lasting uh, trials uh, area 
generally tends to drop and that increases fat utilization and therefore increases oxygen utilization due, due to that. So that is linked to the fact that, well, we want to keep the carbohydrate utilization high and therefore we feed the carbohydrates during exercise because otherwise if we lean towards fat, they're not as efficient. In fact, uh, world-class marathon runners, they tend to run the marathon with a respiratory exchange, respiratory exchange ratio about one and therefore primarily on carbohydrates. Uh, um, you've got uh, oxygen availability and delivery. So basically the capacity to continuously deliver oxygen and therefore uh, capillarization as well to, to the muscle. And uh, well, that links up to altitude as well. So you may get a uh, different uh, uh, economy to in, in altitude than at sea level. And well, it's probably linked more generally to uh, VO2 max as well. So you get uh, uh, need to enhance uh, the uh, oxygen delivery to the muscle and therefore you create more red blood cells uh, and that eventually uh, lifts up uh, your uh, view to max uh, due to uh, peripheral uh, adaptations and um, from instead a uh, biomechanical and uh, neuromuscular perspective uh, one of the key things uh, uh, that probably differs between running and cycling uh, or uh, other activities that they don't have a stretch shortening cycle is the stiffness of uh, the elastic structures in in the leg primarily in the achilles tendon that basically allows you to storage some of the energy that is coming from the landing of of the step and then use that to propel forward uh, it is very difficult to estimate so uh, when when you look into some modeling related to the uh, contribution of uh, the energy production from uh, uh, um, the stiffness uh, of, of these structures or just like from, from elastic energy saved by, uh, by the running gait, uh, it really ranges from, uh, I believe it's 40 to 60 percent. Don't, don't quote me on that, uh, but there's a review paper about it and you literally see uh, the estimations uh, going all over the place. Uh, so I think we, we still struggle with, with really quantifying that just because it's we, at the moment, uh, we can't really quantify mechanical uh, work in running uh, and uh, you can have metabolic work, but if you don't have mechanical work, then you can't estimate the efficiency of running, uh, which which is basically giving you the capacity of, of these structures to uh, produce work. Uh, within the muscle, you have an efficiency which is up to 25%, uh, but again, Due to these structures, uh, it seems with running, it can go up to 40, 45, 50%, or perhaps even more with, uh, with sprinting. Uh, so basically, the more stiff uh, your structure tendons and elastic structures are, the less energy you need uh, to propel forward. And of course, on the other hand, uh, you may risk to get injured if the stiffness is, is too high. So uh, that's also to, to keep in mind. Uh, and then... We've got uh, muscle activation. Uh, it is quite difficult to measure because uh, you've got EMG, uh, which is uh, usually on uh, surface uh, and uh, at the moment is not accurate enough to, to give you uh, a specific insight uh, uh, unless you, you measure it multiple times. Uh, but it seems, uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, strength training can, can help with uh, reducing uh, the co-contractions and basically enhancing intra and intermuscular efficiency of, of the muscles. So that would reduce the cost of exercise because you're using less muscle fibers uh, for that given effort. Uh, and then when we look into uh, the other biomechanical parameters, you also have uh, ground contact time. So the lower the contact time, the more springy you are. So the more elastic you can be and you can use that potential energy from uh, from the step uh, uh, to to propel forward uh, for that vertical oscillate oscillation uh, vertical oscillations uh, and that's basically telling you where where is the direction of your push so of course as you run you can't go only forward you you go up and forward uh, but the more vertical oscillation is gonna increase the cost uh, because uh, 
you're pushing perhaps a bit too high. Uh, so with middle distance runners, uh, you can clearly see that uh, on, on a treadmill, uh, they tend to bounce much more than uh, the marathon runners, whether marathon runners, they tend to be much more flat. So vertical oscill oscillation there will be quite different uh, and uh, that is going to have an influence on, on the cost of, of exercise. And then, uh, well, recently footwear, uh, they've been uh, a game changer for, for running and even triathlon. So I uh, don't think it's going to be part of the discussion today, but certainly something that uh, allows you to, to save energy due to mechanical changes and mechanical uh, enhancement of efficiency. And what are some training interventions or uh, training strategies, mm -hmm. training factors uh, that allows a runner uh, to improve their running economy, whether it's in the short term or in the long term over, over years and years? Yeah, uh, there's a good review from uh, Barnes uh, 2015 about it. Uh, and basically, well, when they, they reviewed the, the studies uh, related to that, they found uh, that high intensity training can improve uh, running economy acutely. Uh, you've got altitude training uh, that can help uh, from, from what we said before, basically having more hemoglobin mass delivering oxygen to, to the muscles. Uh, you've got strength training, uh, and we may want to get in some details about it uh, uh, later if, if you've got the time, but basically uh, via strength training, uh, uh, you may alter that uh, stiffness that we mentioned before, as well as uh, potentially just uh, enhancing the coordination within and between muscles uh, and therefore reducing uh, the utilization of uh, the fibers. Uh, and, and then one other way for which strength training may, may create uh, these adaptations uh, and, and improve economy is uh, basically you increase this, this strength seeding of the single fiber, the strength, the, the, yeah, the, basically the maximum strength of the single fiber and therefore to produce the same uh, effort, the same uh, uh, strike length, uh, you may be able to use uh, less fibers because the strength of every given one of them is higher now. So if your ceiling is 100 and you bring it up to 120, uh, and uh, let's say you're using 30% uh, of your fiber at 100, uh, when that goes up to 120, you may use 25. So that helps activating less muscle fibers. It helps uh, uh, having a bit more uh, capillary um, uh, delivery of oxygen via the capillary because when fibers are contracting there's very little oxygen delivery happening uh, uh, to the fiber because it needs to be relaxed uh, and uh, well finally that will help uh, um, reducing the cost of running and as for other interventions uh, Andy show uh, in I think he published a paper in 2017. Uh, he's the physiologist of British athletics and he tried to do downhill running as a strategy to improve running economy. I don't think they found any, any effect, but well, research is, is uh, always tricky from, from this perspective because you, you get underpowered studies. So you may get 12, 13 people and you don't have uh, a difference there, maybe just because they're not there's not enough people to be to be involved in to, to get tested in the study uh, so that may be a strategy even though again there's no evidence of it and i think again kyle barnes uh, for his phd he did a uh, uh, uphill running uh, intervention and he may have found some some effect there but uh, don't quote me on that because i think the sample size was very very low i think they got five different type of uphill running uh, exercises and uh, uh, they found some effect uh, for for some of the of the training sessions but the sample size was very little literally less than six people per per type of training so again very difficult to give any insights on on these these numbers got it yeah and what about durability? Can you define durability, and and uh, then we can move on to discuss the how durability and and economy might be connected. Yeah, so um, durability it can be possibly defined uh, as uh, the fourth factor of endurance performance, uh, or well, that's what 
some authors they've been pointing out recently, and I think the first one doing it has been Andrew Jones. Uh, uh, firstly, in his paper with uh, uh, with the analysis of uh, Eliud Kipchog and other people involved uh, with the Breaking Two study, and uh, and then uh, Stephen Saylor and Ed Mounder as well in a review paper uh, back in 2021. But yeah, basically, is the ability of uh, the athletes uh, to uh, maintain uh, their physiology or their the biomechanics efficiency or any of the f- parameters that we can measure that they can influence performance consistently over time. So there's a lot of, uh, well, a lot. There are a few papers now out about cycling and how the power re- power duration relationship changes as we fatigue and uh, how high-profile athletes, uh, so world tour cyclists, uh, they can maintain uh, high power outputs even after a given amount of work compared to junior athletes or under 23 athletes. So yeah, it, it basically just tells you, well, are you able to maintain uh, your uh, uh, ability to produce efforts uh, in a fresh state uh, all the way till the end of a race or all the way to uh, uh, after a given amount of work you've produced uh, or uh, any type of interval efforts you you may you may do so there's some research happening at the moment also about interval training and how that uh, uh, may affect uh, um, parameters such as uh, the power duration curve or other other variables that can be measured mm. so so clearly uh for most athletes and the, the best athletes maybe have the, the least detriment in performance but th- there is that detriment in performance if you go out and do a, a a solid ride for three hours and then you try to do your or you try to do a hard 20 minute effort at the beginning and the end you're probably going to be most most listeners here are going to not do as good in the the one at the end of a of a hard three hour ride, and uh, that's what a lot of the uh, the the world tour cycling is about being being the, at your strongest at the end of of the stage. Um, but uh, but w- there's also the fact or the question of what are the physiological parameters that are maybe changing underneath that performance change. So how much do we know about about that in general? And then maybe we can discuss how running economy is uh, is a part of that. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And there's a lot of interest at the moment. There's quite some field data, but uh, there's limited evidence of uh, what are the physiological changes happening. Uh, you, you do get a lot of studies related to fatigue and how that influences or how the development of parameters changes due to fatigue. Uh, One thing that uh, is probably very important uh, uh, from an applied perspective is the specificity of the task. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, well, you get two cyclists uh, that they perform uh, a given amount of uh, uh, power for two or three hours, and then they they still be able to maintain uh, high powers uh, then. Uh, So that's the performance for their events uh, with running uh, and let's say the marathon, you basically just want to be able to maintain that pace without having a cardiac drift uh, or having uh, changes in your biomechanics and so on. Uh, In triathlon, it differs even more because you got the ability to basically cope with uh, the high intensity efforts of the bike, uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, short distance uh, and Olympic distance, so sprint and Olympic, uh, you got fast swim that uh, that has to allow you to be in the pack for for the for the ride and then you got the bike which is usually quite intense and with high intensity efforts and then uh, you've got the run which is well sort of even paced uh, but well it depends where you're sitting in 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 the race in that moment so the demand and uh, the performance uh, uh, changes, the determinants of performance changes uh, uh, and physiological changes uh, that happen in the bike uh, of the run uh, uh, or even just on the bike itself uh, from the triathlon is going to be completely different than the demands uh, and the changes of physiology that are happening on the World Tour cycling team. So if you want to try to look into what is changing physiologically and uh, how that can inform performance, you probably need to be quite specific with uh, 
your sort of fatiguing protocols. Uh, but yeah, in general, from what we've seen, uh, critical power drops. Uh, uh, LT1 also, uh, VT1 also seems to drop. There's a study from uh, uh, Edmunder and uh, uh, Stevenson, 2022, about this. Uh, and they found that with, uh, I think, recreationally trained athletes, uh, VT1 dropped uh, from a uh, uh, fresh state after two and a half hours of cycling around VT1. Um, you've got changes in uh, if cycling efficiency or running economy, and we can get into the details of that later, but basically it seems that you've got an increase in oxygen cost that leads up to uh, it leads up to an increase of uh, uh, basically your fraction of utilization of VO2 max. And then as for VO2 max, uh, well, we've got data from our lab uh, that are not published uh, yet, uh, but it seems that VO2 max also changes and it seems to, to drop, whether that is VO2 max or is uh, VO2 peak, so the ability just to uh, produce high intensity efforts uh, uh, but that may not be a real view to max physiologically. Um, it's a different thing, but yeah, it seems like your ceiling is also dropping. So basically, uh, to keep it simple and running, for example, you have an increase in oxygen cost and a decrease in view to max. So your fraction of utilization, if at the beginning is 80%, after two hours, it may be 85, 87% view to max. And that will have an influence of everything else in the race. Uh, same for biomechanics related parameters or uh, fatigue related parameters from a neuromuscular perspective. So central and peripheral fatigue, they're gonna change. Uh, dehydration, so you'll have uh, uh, most likely uh, dehydration occurring during the exercise. And uh, if you're getting dehydrated above two to three percent, you may incur in reduced uh, uh, performance uh, because of uh, the literature that is available on that. And basically, just like reduced ability of uh, uh, your uh, biological processes to, to be optimal, uh, you've got increasing cold temperature. So again, uh, when you're exercising the heat, uh, you're not going to perform as well as uh, exercising in, in a fresh uh, condition. And uh, well, that's basically, I wouldn't say similar, but, but as your cold temperature goes up, uh, your metabolism uh, uh, just slightly changes and your homeostasis is not going to be as optimal anymore. So these are just like a few uh, parameters that we can measure that they change during exercise. Uh, how do these link to performance? Uh, it will be it will vary depend on depending on the event and uh, and how specific you want to be with that. Um, another thing, it can well be maximum sprinting speed. So I don't think there's any study out there measuring the changes in maximum sprinting speed pre post uh, uh, continuous running. Um, no, actually, yeah, there are a few from Ivaskola in in Finland and. Uh, uh, there again, they did the fund drop between 15 and 20 percent, I believe, uh, or let's say 10 to 10 to 15, just to be on the safe side. Uh, so your ability to produce uh, maximal efforts also reduces, and and W prime, D prime, they may be reduced as well due to that. So that's the anaerobic capacity that you can you can have above critical power, basically. So there's. Basically, most most factors seem to be uh, affected naturally, as as we would be expect, I, I guess. And I think a key point that you made was about the specificity that if you want to assess how whether it's physiolog physiological markers or just the performance itself, how it's affected, then being specific about the protocol. I remember uh, when talking with. Uh, I actually can't remember if it was uh, Adil Tweiten or Olaf Alexander Bu who talked about it, but when the Norwegians had been doing quite a lot of specific testing uh, in the Tokyo build-up with just doing a 1,500-meter hard or all-out swim and a 40K bike or one-hour bike and and doing tests, doing running tests in a fatigue state or doing biking tests after that 1,500-meter hard uh hard swim and, and so on so just testing really specifically so that's a that's an excellent point and but that would obviously be different for a marathoner 
or a world tour cyclist, they would design the protocol specifically for those activities. Is this something that you have tested within the Italian Federation doing tests in a fatigue state? Uh, we're considering it. Uh, it's not happening at the moment. Uh, again, it's very difficult logistically, but I think it may be valuable. Uh, I think we've, we're at the point where we can have an idea about uh, the parameters that we want to measure uh, and that they may change more than others uh, due to fatigue development mainly from the from the bike uh, but yeah at the moment uh, we we didn't test any any of these parameters yet we we're on on our way to convince some some of the athletes or coaches to do it uh, but uh, yeah didn't do it yet i think the uh, danish team are doing something related to that with uh, half ironman and ironman distances um and uh, yeah i can't think of any anybody else that uh, that is testing it at the moment, uh, at least from 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 the trials and world. Uh, again, it's very difficult uh, for for athletes as well, and that's one of the conversations that I had with uh, Andy Show and and Andy Jones as well. As well, how can we test uh, this capacity without affecting the training of the athletes? Because uh, with this level of athletes, you really need to push them towards the limit uh, to get some changes that are significant and they, they're not only noise from, from the measures. Uh, so if they're within the error of measurement, then you're just not sure if this is changing or not. Uh, and if you want to get outside that uh, uh, uncertainty, well, with this this level of it's you you need to push them very hard and then uh, if you push them very hard uh, then they may take two or three days to recover and uh, most of the time they don't have two or three days to recover so that's one point from from the athlete and uh, and the program and the other one from us as a support team uh, but you just don't have enough time in the day to do it because you would have uh, probably two and a half uh, hours or maybe three hours of testing for one single athlete. And then you have to repeat it over seven or eight. Uh, well, it really depends on how many you want to test. So with the Norwegian team, uh, maybe Olaf had just uh, Gustav and uh, um, and uh, Blumenfeld. So that may be a bit more suitable. Uh, but if you have a big group uh, and with big, I believe, if you speak about six or seven, it's already big for, for this type of testing. It really requires you a lot of work. Uh, plus, you may want to test uh, the fresh condition first. So you may want to test, I don't know, economy or Max or whatever, or critical speed, power in a fresh state uh, and then in a fatigue state. So you would have to have two tests within maybe 10, 15 days max. Uh, and yeah, that adds up uh, uh, a lot of layers of compli complications from a logistical perspective, as well as uh, time constraints, com time constraints perspective. Yeah, and and not just the recovery before the test, but even if you are going to do a, a let's say a fresh state VO2 max test, you don't want to do it the day after you've been training for six hours with a lot of quality, right? Because that you, you need maybe you don't need to taper fully for it, but but at least you don't want to be fatigued for it so you have to adjust the training before it a little bit don't don't you think yeah yeah uh that that can be standardized i think so you because triathletes they are consistently uh training in a semi-fatigued state uh, just because of the volumes they have so as long as you standardize that i don't think you'll have a big influence of it uh, so as, as we said at the beginning, you, you have to compromise something. So if you want to test, uh, let's say, VO2max fresh and then a VO2max in a fatigue state, uh, then uh, you may just uh, maintain similar workouts or training sessions, uh, let's say, the two days before, and then and then trial it. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, I don't think it's, it's feasible. Uh, um, unless you do it maybe off-season, but then if you do it off-season, you're measuring something else because you don't have that amount of work accumulated that is going to lead up to the races. And as we said before, as you want to be specific, uh, if you test uh, that capacity six months, well, in, in interacting six months off, it doesn't happen, but in running it may. Uh, but let, let's say two months off a race and then two weeks off a race, the physiology is going to be quite different from the athlete. Uh, so... 
it is quite complicated. Uh, one thing that may be helpful is maybe measuring uh, like training data and looking to like long rides or run of bike uh, from training data and see how these they they change over time maybe changes in heart rate uh, due to or changes in uh, the um, ratio between heart rate and and pace uh, changes so if you have uh it's called, I think they, they try to name it as decoupling. So basically the difference uh, between uh, the heart rate corresponding to the pace in a fresh state uh, versus what's happening when you're fatigued. So if your pace drops uh, and your heart rate remains stable, you have decoupling. If you have a, uh, the same pace but the heart rate goes up, you still have decoupling. And I don't I, I can't remember how it's defined, uh, but it's part of the uh, review paper from from under I I've mentioned before. So that may give you some insights, but uh, again, it's not going to tell you the physiological changes. It's just going to tell you well, the athlete is is having a high effort, is slowing down or or not. So possibly a bit easier from from a field testing, uh, but uh, yeah, you'll have quite little insights from a physiological perspective exactly and and with the coupling there's the problem of the environmental factors that for example a lot of a lot of athletes are especially think about age group athletes that don't start their season in in march necessarily in in abu dhabi like the short course elite athletes do but they might be gearing up to start racing really now uh in the northern hemisphere in at the end of may as we're talking or june july and they might be getting fitter and fitter compared to the winter but as the temperatures get higher and higher outdoors you might not really see that in the decoupling data because heart rate at least is something that i personally can see in my training data that my heart rate is definitely higher now than it was in uh let's say february for the equivalent workout just because the temperature difference is so big uh i don't think that that means that i'm any less fit i don't i don't feel like i am so if you are going to use that method then you have to really factor in the temperature and and make it somewhat standardized again but um going moving on to i guess the important follow-up is there are there things that can be done interventions uh, that can be done or uh, just factors we should be aware about regarding how to improve your durability yeah uh, i think there's no well there are a couple of uh, ideas around uh, and uh, um, there's not really a proper intervention that has been done so far uh, we've got a couple of uh, attempts uh, let's say to look into how let's say strength training for example can improve uh, uh, your performance in a fatigue state or repeated sprint training can improve your performance in a fatigue state and they're coming from the group of bent runner study in, in norway so uh, i think the first paper with elite athletes at least uh, was from runner study in 2011 with uh, uh, elite cyclists they got three hours uh, of uh, uh, cycling at 45% Pmax, uh, well, basically just like easy-ish uh, riding, and then they had a f- five minutes all-out test, uh, and they measured it before and after uh, 11 weeks of strength training, uh, and they found a 7% improvement uh, in the uh, five minutes uh, time trial uh, performance. They then repeated it with cross-country skiers uh, and with uh, female dual athletes uh, with uh, couple of other studies in 2017 i think they've been published and they said they found similar patterns for which uh, strength training seemed uh, to provide a benefit uh, to the performance uh, performed in a fatigue state um, and they measured the uh, oxygen consumption throughout uh, so we can call it it's not really uh, running economy because, of course, it's not running. Uh, uh, but basically, the oxygen cost uh, or the VO2 of the exercise and how that drifts uh, or how that drifted uh, during, during the trials. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with, elite, uh, trials, uh, with elite cyclists, uh, bent uh, runners that found that uh, uh, there was a slight uh, decrease in, in the drift of oxygen from zero to three hours with the training group compared to the control group um, and that's something that we've just finished to do uh, with runners as well here at Loughborough uh, so we had an intervention uh, uh, it's still not published we, we're going to present it at uh, 
uh, ECSS conference that is happening in, in a month or so. Basically, we've got two groups of uh, 14 uh, well-trained athletes. Uh, with well-trained uh, women, uh, I think the 10K performance was about 39 minutes. Uh, so far, quite far from uh, what, what the athletes that we've been talking about now and the athletes uh, uh, that just train regularly. But for research, it's, it's a decent standard level uh, and we've got uh, them running 90 minutes and then do a time to exhaustion at 95% uh, VO2 max and measure that before and after uh, 10 weeks of uh, strength training intervention and we did not find actually an improvement in running economy in a fresh state uh, but it seems uh, that the drift uh, towards the end uh, didn't happen as much uh, after the, the intervention with the strength group compared to both pre-intervention and control group. And uh, also time to exhaustion at 95% uh, got uh, roughly 40% better. Uh, so that, that can help with enhancing uh, this fatigue uh, resistance, fatigue development, durability uh, parameter that we've mentioned. Uh, again, it, it needs to be specific. So we did uh, this protocol because we wanted to inform marathon performance so the intensity of the 90 minutes was roughly at marathon pace and at five minutes at the end uh, well actually slightly faster than marathon pace and at five minutes at the end uh, were basically uh, intended to be like the final kick of the last uh, kilometer or two of the race when when you want to push yourself uh, over the finish line or you have to produce high efforts to to win a race uh, at the moment, uh, you see more and more races where you get three or four athletes that are all the way to 38, 39 kilometers together, and then eventually somebody can can uh, lead and and win with with almost like a sprinting finish, which is, which wasn't the case a few years ago. Uh, so that's something that well we've been trying, and there's some evidence uh, from other sports. Uh, you, you have evidence of uh, uh, carbohydrate intake as well. So the group of Andy Jones uh, with uh, Ida Clark, uh, film papers 2018, 2019, uh, they've got uh, two hours of cycling uh, between uh, GET and uh, critical power, and then they measured critical power uh, in, in a conditions with carbohydrate feeding and uh, one with pl placebo. And they found that critical power didn't drop as much with uh, carbohydrate feeding. And well, that makes sense. Basically, you want to eat carbohydrates uh, to be able to maintain your ability to uh, uh, maintain your physiology similar to uh, a fresh state, which, which links up to what we said before with uh, the potential effect of carbohydrate with reducing oxygen drift uh, during exercise uh, and and just uh, reduce the uh, amount of fat that you're using which are less less efficient uh, some other interventions that uh, can be helpful is possibly training volume over the years uh, or just like consistent exposure to aerobic exercise uh, there's no intervention for that but that's basically what you we've seen with these papers about comparison between uh, under 23 athletes and war two cyclists uh so they war two cyclists they've got more time to be exposed to to the to, to year in year out uh, high volume of training and uh, well that seems to be uh, logical as well and if you look into some other sports uh, it may make sense uh, so with uh, running for example middle distance runners uh, 800 1500 meters uh, they can be very successful even if they're quite young so uh, 18 19 20 years old uh, records uh, they they not very far from the world records uh, whether if you look at the marathon it happens very rarely that you get a uh, very high performing athlete uh, being younger than 25, 26 years old. So that uh, may connect uh, to, to that uh, narrative and uh, perhaps on triathlon as well, uh, you tend to move to longer distances as you, as you age. And uh, uh, if you look at the arena games, for example, which are very short, uh, you have young athletes that they can 
they can compete quite well, but then when they move towards uh, the Olympic distance, they're not uh, ready yet for it. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. You can find the show notes for this episode on scientifictriathlon.com and you can find lots of links, uh, both to related episodes that I've done here before on the podcast uh, with guests we mentioned uh, and uh, also uh, papers that we mentioned throughout this interview. I won't list them all, but uh, if for those of you interested, there's a bunch of links to uh, other episodes and to papers that are related to what we discussed here today. Next Monday, we will have part two of this interview, and uh, here is a tiny extract of what you will hear then. The very, very first thing that Renato does is just, just targeting the race uh, and then say, okay, we know that we can run at this pace or we aim to run at this pace based on uh, the time we've got and where, it, where is your starting point, uh, and then moving backwards from there. So you got your specific target uh, and then you got uh, the support from the endurance and speed side so you got uh, let's say five percent well speed uh, specific speed plus minus five percent uh, and then plus minus ten percent and then plus minus fifteen percent uh, and that sort of creates a final of uh, speeds and intensities that uh, they need to be targeted during uh, during the training period um, so you you want to start off from the extremes, uh, so from the speed and endurance perspective. Uh, when we speak about specific workouts, so you still have uh, the uh, easy aerobic uh, exercise just as a uh, aerobic support and maintenance and uh, uh, just easy training, really. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when you look into the workouts, you've got maybe you start off 20% or 50% uh slower and faster as as targets for your workouts and then you finally closer and closer to the race pace as weeks and months uh, move uh, move forward all right so that is what you will have uh on tap for next week so stay tuned for that I also have a piece of housekeeping here and that is just a reminder that I have a few Q&A episodes planned that I will be recording shortly and uh, I have the following topics. So if you have uh, questions on any of these topics, uh, you can submit multiple questions on multiple topics Then please send them to me via email ideally and I'll put them in my list. So the topics that I will be doing Q&As on are one, racing, two, nutrition, three, myths and pseudoscience, four, technology, and five, testing. I don't know yet which order, but any of these topics, if you have questions, just send them in, please. The more, the merrier. A second piece of housekeeping is that for those of you that have reached out about coaching or training plans, uh, especially if you have reached out through a contact form on scientifictriathlon.com rather than email me, emailing me directly. My email, by the way, is michael at scientifictriathlon.com and I believe it's in the episode show notes as well. Um, but if you have reached out through a contact form uh, and you haven't received a reply, then it may be because my email gets stuck in spam filters. So in that case, try to email me directly uh, or better yet, uh, contact me on Instagram or Twitter uh, because that is uh, just an issue that I have noticed that uh, not everybody receives my emails. It, uh, yeah, it looks like, I don't know, a mass email address, scientifictriathlon.com. So, uh, so yeah, in certain cases, I have uh, you, you may not have received my reply even though I did reply to you. And in that case, I would advise you to just reach out through another channel and uh, yeah, then we can, uh, we can discuss. So sorry if that has affected you. Uh, I promise that I, I get back to all, uh, all inquiries. And uh, yeah, it's definitely not something that I haven't missed any emails or anything, but it might be a spam filter issue. So yeah, just try again, please. And we can get that sorted. Uh, all right, so that's it with housekeeping, uh, a bit more than normal uh, for this one. But let's finish off now. Thank our sponsors, Form, that you can find on forumsoon.com forward slash TTS. Improve your swim training with real-time metrics like pace, stroke rate, and heart rate, and advanced post-swim analysis. And use the code TTS15 to get 15% off the Form Smart Swim Goggles. And thank you to Senate. Use the Senate Swim Training to improve your technique, power, and swim training consistency. Even if you have just 15 minutes at home available, you can get in a time-efficient Senate workout that will help Help you swim better in the water. You can try the Senate risk free for up to 30 days and get 20% off your first order on sanitarycare.com or slash TTS. Thank you as always for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft. Love.